So welcome everyone to a new year. It's 2022. We've put a, hopefully a successful end on 2021. Um, we've got a few successes to discuss in the news. Uh, the tonight's topic is the business of androids. Uh, I've been looking into this a lot from a uh, um, how things could pan out and the business perspectives of it. And there have been a few presentations online about it. So we'll get into that. But first, the news. So things had been going swimmingly for the uh, James Webb Space Telescope. Um, the uh, starboard wing of the primary mirror was deployed today uh, about 1.17 p.m. Eastern time. So the secondary mirror is deployed. The primary mirror and both of its side wing mirrors are deployed. Um, the cover, I guess you could say the electronically controlled lens cap on the MIRI instrument was opened uh, and the power applied to it. They didn't have the, the cryo cooler on just yet. Not sure exactly when they proclaimed that was turned on, but uh, MIRI is the, uh, the deep, the middle infrared uh, imaging and spectroscopy camera. So that proved to, to be fine. Um, Obviously, since shortly after launch, the solar panel was working and the S-band radio antenna was working. I haven't seen anything on the, the KA uh, antenna uh, from the Deep Space Network. KA is the one reserved for the um, higher bandwidth. Uh, you know, I think it's maybe 14 megabits <laughs> higher is a uh, perspective. Um, the S-band is working fine. And uh, that's typically around, uh, I think, 8.2 gigahertz. So if you have a down converter, you can probably receive it. But uh, it's going well. They've got a few instruments left to check out. Uh, and they've got to uh, cool everything down further. And then they've got to uh, adjust all 18 mirror segments so they converge onto the secondary. Um, the instruments area has three tertiary mirrors so they can compensate for any slight offset of the secondary doing that. Um, I got an email from uh, Space Telescope Science Institute that uh, they're going to be having future public event opportunities as data starts to roll in from the telescope. And uh, I've signed up to uh, please add my name to the list so they'll send me out a survey when that occurs. I've suggested to them two additional things they might want to get the public involved in. Um, the first one is imaging. Yes, it was a big letdown for all of us. That, what do you mean there are no visual cameras anywhere on the web? Uh, have you guys not seen the difference between what goes on with a Starlink uh, satellite launch or a SpaceX satellite launch versus the other guys? And by other guys, I mean, just about any other space program in any other country. They don't have a lot of cameras on the outside and it's, it's hard to get the public involved when they're just looking at numbers spinning by and they don't understand where the numbers come from. So uh, I suggested, you know, if, if you could get the uh, night sky coordinates of the web once it gets into its uh, L2 halo orbit out to the public through the normal means, then uh, maybe you could get some amateurs to take pictures of it and was very surprised to see that um, they actually had two amateurs, one with a 12 inch and one with a 17 inch telescope uh, getting tracking of a little white dot moving across the sky over a time lapse. Uh, so they could actually see the telescope before the sunshade was actually deployed. Now that the sunshade is deployed, it should be a lot more reflective, a lot larger surface area. So we'll, we'll see about that one. Uh, and the second one was uh, for those folks that are into uh, radio astronomy, a QSL kind of capability where if you can confirm uh, digital reception of the S-band signal, that uh, maybe they could give you an automated email back saying, yep, you received it. And then once the KA band is working and um, you know, people write the uh, plugins to do the KA band demodulation for some software defined radio telescope uh, apps to be able to actually receive stuff more than just number data. 
picture data. Uh, but that's probably going to be about six plus months away. So far, so good. Anybody have any questions about the James Webb Space Telescope? Yeah, I think they said that they deployed the extra these two panels, but they're not locked yet. Is that correct? Uh, no, as far as I can tell, they are locked. Um, oh. what, what they need to do is every one of the 18 mirror segments has a XY motor uh, solenoids yeah. on the back of them, and they have to tilt adjust all of them to point in the same place. Now, they don't have a, a very wide range of motion, but if you're off by a uh, certainly a small number of millimeters, if not fractions of a millimeter on each of those mirrors, that could mean a bright image or a dim image. So they have to um, converge all the mirrors. But as far as I know, the, the two side wing mirror arrays of three mirrors each are locked. Very nice. OK. OK, uh, next up is the planet Venus. Uh, apparently, they've been doing some spectroscopic studies and determined that the, uh, the atmosphere of the planet Venus is not quite as acidic as they first thought it was. Uh, the way they're judging it is, it's more like stomach acid than battery acid. Well, okay, well, stomach acid is closer to hydrochloric and battery acid is closer to sulfuric. So I, I don't know how that applies, but yeah, it's not quite as acidic. And what they're postulating is that there are salt deposits on the surface of Venus and there are high speed winds that are kicking that salt up into the upper atmosphere, causing the atmosphere to be less acidic. So it, it's got its own uh, antacid pills <laughs> uh, that is making the atmosphere uh, less acidic. And what that could mean is that if we send landers to Venus in the future, that maybe we can focus more on the crushing pressure or the high temperature and less on uh, building it where the acid won't destroy it. And this one I found a little interesting that uh, they think they finally figured out why comets glow green. I always thought it was because there was oxygen in the water vapor that was being uh, bled off of the comet. But it turns out there is a material uh, called dicarbon that is rare to not exist in on Earth because it, it gets disrupted very quickly in Earth's atmosphere. But apparently, as it comes off of the surface of comets, um, it gets energized by the solar radiation. And they believe that's why the comets glow green. I wonder if it's something like dicarolium. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> um, they just referred to it as dicarbon. Yeah. What, what's the structure? If you say dicarbon, is that like a a dipolar atom of two carbon? Yes, it, it's, atoms, suppo or? it's supposedly a, uh, a dual carbon atom joining, and that's not very stable. So as soon as it gets I, hit by some energy, it splits. I'm surprised it wouldn't be stable. It's, it sounds like it would be stable. But... Well, if it, if it had some uh, hydrogen and some oxygen to go with it, it would be stable. It, it'd form something with a longer chain. But in the absence of other elements, uh, which you'd think with a lot of water on the comet, they'd have lots of hydrogen. Um, but uh, as the saying goes, this is their current postulation. Maybe someday we'll uh, land something on a comet and uh, hopefully park it on the backside where it doesn't get hit by the solar radiation. Or we'll sacrifice it after it gets a certain uh, distance from the sun. OK, and if, if you remember, um, the original postulation of the existence of dark matter had to do with, uh, if you look at the rotation of stars on the outer edge of a galaxy, they're rotating at a, uh, what would be a, a non-predicted speed, non-predicted velocity versus the core of the galaxy. And that was attributed to dark matter holding the galaxy together and spinning things uh, collectively rather than allowing them to spin separately. Uh, if, you, if you've ever uh, studied the uh, orbits of things around the Earth, you'll note that, uh, gee, uh, if I look at um, the space station, it goes by about every 90 minutes. But if I think of a uh, uh, geosynchronous satellite, uh, it 
goes by every 24 hours. So it's locked in with whatever point on the earth it is above. Uh, so the speed changes, the aerial, the, the aerial velocity changes, uh, but apparently not so with most galaxies and they believe that that's due to dark matter. However, they have found what they refer to as faint fluffy galaxies. This is 250,000 light years away. Uh, and somehow they believe that it's fluffy because it lacks dark matter. And as usual, this is their current postulation. Uh, other people have said, well, maybe it's because this is a younger galaxy and it hasn't sort of come together yet. Uh, but it's only 250,000 light years away, so it can't be that young. It's not like the you know, galaxies we see at the billion plus light year distance where we're seeing so far back in time that it may be a young galaxy that's kind of smudgy and not yet uh, solidly formed. But uh, that's kind of what they're thinking now is, well, maybe some galaxies don't have a lot of dark matter in them and that's why they stay diffuse. But uh, we'll wait for more observational evidence and then maybe they can come up with a conclusion. And talk about things back in time. In the galaxy NGC 5731, which is about 120 million light years away, they were monitoring a red supergiant star. Uh, now, if you think of a galaxy that is 120 million light years away, um, that red supergiant's not going to be so super and giant, but uh, I guess they monitored it through. Uh, radio astronomy, because that way you can pick it up spectroscopically. And uh, they monitored it. They presumed that it was going to go supernova because it was you know, getting late stage and enlarging itself. And it went supernova. So this is the first recorded evidence of a red supergiant that was swelling up, had not yet gone nova, went nova, and then they monitored it as it declined. So this is our first evidence of a red supergiant that actually went supernova, it didn't just go nova. But if, if you ever look at the data from such observations, the, um, as, as they say, the sigmas aren't in its favor. So how many uh, decimal digits did you have to go out to prove that it was really an enlarging red supergiant versus just a red giant? Uh, so... So between you, you do, what's you the difference do between spectroscopy because depending on the temperature you see different signals of different metals so that's why you know yeah like I said radio spectroscopy <laughs> but they actually did they actually observed this uh, I think it was three years ago um, they watched it for 130 days so they watched it before during and after. So the supernova is giving off heavier, heavier elements? No, the color of the star within the galaxy is such that you can discern that it is comprised of heavier elements. Okay, and to start off the new year, uh, SpaceX launched another uh, Starlink constellation, this time with 49 satellites aboard it. Successful launch, successful first stage recovery, and the uh, satellites made it into their target orbit. Now, you might ask, why only 49 satellites <laughs> and not its normal, like close to 60? It wasn't a ride share. There weren't other satellites on board. It's because they went south and had to avoid the Bahamas. Now, why did they go south? Uh, well, um, seems like their last Starlink launch, the first stage took a real beating in the North Atlantic seas on its way back to. Uh, Florida. And that required them to replace the nine Merlin engines on the bottom of it and all three landing leg struts. That's expensive. That's not as much of a reusable rocket as we thought. So they reduced the number of satellites on board. These are still the Starlink version 1.5 with the laser uh, intersatellite communication. Uh, they reduced the number of satellites on board and it took off and went east and then south to avoid you know, anything accidentally falling over the Bahamas. Um, and then it kind of like took a tight dog leg turn with the second stage. Uh, and that meant they were gonna expend more fuel. About, uh, I think it's about a thousand um, 
kilograms uh, more fuel than uh, they had planned. So they had to reduce the number of satellites, but uh, it successfully made it to orbit. And the last news item is Cordova Road Seawall Project has officially been identified as essentially complete. They've got some last minute uh, touch up stuff to do, but it's essentially complete. For those people in Fort Lauderdale, Cordova Road is uh, southeastern Fort Lauderdale near 17th Street Causeway. And it's a road that goes north south through that, that part of uh, Fort Lauderdale. It's an older part of Fort Lauderdale. And there's a lot of finger islands going out towards the intercoastal. And that land was, you know, from the late 1920s into early 1930s when they first created those, those finger islands. And so they built homes on them. And it turns out during recent king tides, these are the highest tides of the year, um, it floods. The houses are built up on land, so the houses don't flood. Um, but Cordova Road, the road that joins all those finger islands, would get flooded. And when it would get flooded, the statement was, bring your boat, not your car. So that's mm -hmm. not just, you know, an inch or two of water. That's enough water that you should be in a boat, not a car. So the city of Fort Lauderdale decided to uh, raise the road and put in a seawall. And they've been doing this for a couple of years. It was supposed to be finished in 2020. But, uh, you know, things being what they are, they finished in late 2021. So for those people that think uh, coastal flooding doesn't exist and that uh, nobody's spending any money to mitigate any of it, well, here's proof positive that the city of Fort Lauderdale had to spend, I think it's more than a few million dollars. Uh, don't see the exact number here. I think yeah, it's more than a few. They'll raise my rent. Yeah, it was more more than a few million dollars to adjust the height of Cordova Road and to put in a seawall. And also there were a lot of uh, docks along the uh, joining end of the Finger Islands and those docks went bye-bye. So the seawall cut off those docks and they had to put in stormwater sewer system. So they used the uh, swale, the grass swale to dig that up and put in the stormwater drainage system. So, yeah, we're actually spending money to deal with the uh, coastal flooding that uh, didn't exist in the 1920s. But the funny thing, they are only doing those kinds of things where the houses are, you know, like $20 million. Well, you, so have, to keep, you, have, to keep, you have to keep up the property values so that the county tax assessor can still assess them at, you know, a million plus dollars per property instead of, you know, 200,000. That's a lot of tax rolls. So the money that they expend to do this, the city more than makes up for it in its uh, property tax uh, floating. Sure. So uh, keeps things high and dry up until I have to move up to, uh, you know, Orlando, I'm fine. And that's all the news I had for this week. Does anybody else have anything to report? Okay. Uh, tonight's topic is the business of androids. Uh, not, not the mobile phone kind. This is the robotic kind. Next week, we'll discuss access and use of scientific research data. All these things that we're creating and sending out into space are creating data. And that data has to come back and get stored. And uh, the uh, Congress has actually said, if you're going to create a mission for a spacecraft to go out into space or for a telescope to be built, you have to include as part of the charter for that mission, the mission definition, um, that you're going to have a part of the plan for storing all that data pretty much in perpetuity for public access for amateurs to be able to make scientific discoveries because they found out with a lot of the Hubble data and a lot of the radio astronomy data that you can go back to that, that, back to that data a decade, 20 years later and find new things that the original mission did not discover because that's not what they were looking for. But now that we have computers that can, you know, you don't have to blink to uh, glass film plates. You can just have computers dither the images and do a delta. 
So you can see a lot more things that you didn't see originally. And this is not about just the, the uh, finalized pretty pictures. This is about access to the vetted, so it's valid, but raw data so that you can do other things with it. So that'll, I think, be interesting. OK, for those that might not think that androids are a related topic, uh, yes, it does relate to astronomy. It does relate to space programs. Um, so we can already send robotic autonomous spacecraft. So all these things that we're sending to other places like the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter or the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter or Curiosity and Perseverance rovers on Mars or um, Ingenuity, the helicopter on Mars. And in the not too distant future, we'll actually be sending a submarine, a small submarine, but a submarine to the planet, uh, to the moon Titan to uh, sort of see what's beneath its uh, liquid methane seas. So we're already sending these rather smart craft. And because the position of things in space are always on the move, sometimes due to uh, more than just the radio transmission delay over such long distances, but sometimes they're not even visible to us here on Earth when they're doing their observing thing. So we send them a program and tell them, hey, go execute this. And it might be to take pictures, it might be to drive somewhere, it might be to fly somewhere, but they do their thing and then they come back and say, here's what I did, here's the data I gathered. Uh, so we already have autonomous things out there. But in order to you know, really step it up a, a notch, we need to send people there. Uh, but, you know, because people can just dynamically go, oh, look, that's interesting. What's that? Reach out, grab it, take a look at it, you know, smack it with a hammer, do kinds of things. And uh, that's, you know, why we'd like to send people to Mars and the moon. Um, but we, we need a way to um, prove this stuff out. And that's why you see these uh, Martian simulation environments on Earth to say, well, what, what are the difficulties? What could go wrong? But uh, so uh, if we want to have uh, sort of flexible capabilities on planets like Mars ahead of people arriving there, uh, let's not jeopardize the safety of people. Um, let's send androids instead of sending people. Uh, let's see what that would take to do. Uh, also, if we're gonna build lots of large rockets for going back to the moon and Mars, uh, like SpaceX is planning on doing, automated mass manufacturing capability will exist as we can see with Tesla and their ability to build more and more automobiles. So androids, which should be simpler to build than cars, um, could create a labor force to be first to Mars to build things for us so that it's easier for when the humans arrive. So why don't we just send people because people don't do well mentally in certain environments. So confining them to small spaces for extended periods of time. Uh, if you recall your pandemic experience of being on lockdown, it, it, it's not fun. Uh, so let's take that a step further. And you have no home deliveries of any kind for several years, which would be the case on Mars. And as you've uh, probably realized a couple of months ago, there was a window when Mars was behind the sun and we had no radio communication with Mars whatsoever. So not only would you be away from Earth, but you might be without any communication with Earth whatsoever for certainly several weeks, uh, depending upon you know, other planets that might be longer. And we don't do well confined to spacesuits for extended periods of time. Spacewalks are typically performed in pairs in case something goes wrong. I remember the uh, not so well publicized uh, problem of water inside of a helmet because, oh, uh, if you're a scuba diver, um, in order to prevent your scuba mask from fogging up, you uh, will spit in it and wipe that on the, the glass. And they found that if you use a drop of uh, uh, dish soap like you'd use in a sink, that works much better 
what they didn't realize was uh, some people's eyes are sensitive to that stuff. And they had an astronaut that the inside of his visor was cleaned with that a drop or two of detergent and he was allergic to it and it caused his eyes to start tearing up. Well, wh where does the water go? There's no gravity to drag it down to the bottom of his helmet. So it just started forming around his eyes. It wasn't going anywhere and he eventually couldn't see and the other uh, spacewalking astronaut had to pull him back in uh, to clear up the problem. Uh, and there's a certain amount of oxygen you have, even though it's a, a small tank of liquid oxygen that uh, your spacewalk typically has to last not more than a day. So extended periods of time in spacesuits, not fun. Androids might be better at that. Um, and uh, psychologically, um, you know, we may have to wait for multiple years between, uh, we may have communication, but contact and resupply from Earth may have to wait until planetary alignment is beneficial. Uh, and I know that about every two years, the uh, distance between Earth and Mars will be such that uh, we can send probes there. Um, or, you know, we get good astronomical imaging Mars every two years. And it never gets to be as big as the full moon. Uh, we're also not good at performing menial repetitive tasks. Uh, this is why there are robots in auto manufacturing plants. Um, humans require some downtime and we require distractive entertainment. Uh, we also require multiple shift breaks per day to do things that other people can't do for us. Um, we might require a Saturday or Sunday or a day or two per week downtime just to unwind. And we need that vacay time, the, the vacation a couple of weeks per year. And um, you can't get enough done if, if you basically carve out about what amounts to a little over a month per year, per Earth year of downtime. And then humans require a specialized environment just to keep them alive and well. Um, ionizing radiation, you need protection from that. Otherwise, you're likely to get uh, uh, cancer earlier. Um, the atmospheric pressure would be nice to be between 10 and 14 pounds per square inch to avoid exploding or crushing the human being. Uh, the atmospheric composition should be roughly 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen, so we can breathe. Uh, and so that we can exhale and you do something with the CO2 that we produce. Um, the humidity and the temperature needs to be at a tolerable level so that uh, we don't bake or freeze or swelter or desiccate and dry out. We also have uh, waste elimination to deal with to avoid backups and to avoid uh, anybody making a mess. Um, also, there's social distancing even before the six feet of the pandemic came about. Um, we don't like to be too tightly packed, especially when we're on or off duty. Um, if you think about uh, uh, submariners and submarines, they're tightly packed in their bunks, but the presumption is they're asleep when they're doing that, and they're either at chow or on duty the rest of the time. So the fact that they're tightly packed when they're in their bunks and they're hot bunking um, is an issue, but they mitigate it. And also we can't be around machinery that is making sounds and vibration a lot. So, uh, you know, you're not going to put the uh, residential quarters immediately next to the compressor that produces the atmosphere to keep them alive because the noise would be too much. So under these circumstances, androids make more sense. Um, even if they can initially only perform limited tasks involving construction or monitoring, um, send multiple of them as the first wave. It makes a lot more sense. Uh, they can be sent offline and partially assembled so they actually take up less space than people would. Um, when powered on, they need electricity, but if they're powered off and disassembled, they don't even need electricity. Uh, they certainly don't need food and water and they don't produce uh, a waste buildup. So they're less expensive to keep and they can actually build the facilities required for humans before it becomes critical for life safety. So that it, you know, those environments don't have to be established immediately upon landing. They can take their time to be built. Um, you can make an Android somewhat radiation intolerant. 
um, more so than humans. And since they don't need an, uh, a specific atmosphere like humans do, you might even design them so they don't need spacesuits. I know that the, uh, the upper body android that they designed for the International Space Station, um, it doesn't have a lower body half. It doesn't have any garments. It just has an outer shell. And they believe they can actually use that outside the spacecraft, uh, outside the space station to do labor, to do work. Androids can obviously uh, operate for long shifts between recharges. And if the recharge takes too long, just swap batteries. I mean, you do that on phones. I, I learned that in um, my work with hospital uh, alert communication that uh, you can't go with an iPhone because the battery will run out too quickly as there's not always a good Wi-Fi signal. So you have to find a, a different kind of phone where the battery can just be popped out, a new battery slapped in, and you're back on the air. And if you do it fast enough, the phone doesn't even reset itself if you can do it in under like three seconds. Um, so very time saving. Uh, another thing to think about Androids is they can work as a group of equals. Um, if you have people, unless you've uh, specked out their, their physical prowess and keep them all the same, which might mean certain people can't go, um, not just gender differences, but size differences. And okay, a person that's a uh, software engineer may not be as physically um, capable of lifting heavy weights as someone whose uh, task is mechanical engineering. Uh, so if you have every Android of equal capability, they can all pull the same weight. There's no weak links. Plus Androids don't get claustrophobic bored, require breaks, or need vacations. And you can send uh, spare parts. So if, some, if one of the androids gets damaged, um, replace some parts or fix some malfunctions. And the uh, strange but true part is, if you send enough of them and you lose one due to damage or malfunction, uh, and you cannot get it back working again, um, there's no mission team remorse for having lost one of the crew. Okay, on Earth, there are what is known as fixed place purpose built robots. These are the things that you see in like the auto industry uh, assembly lines. Um, those are very capable. They can lift heavy things. They can be programmed for specific functions. They're usually a single arm with uh, a, a variety of joints so they can move in various ways. But they have to lift heavy things so they're bolted down onto a cement foundation uh, to avoid the counter force. But they're very limited in what they can do. So uh, probably don't want those in space unless you're building an assembly line on another planet. Um, they're good on Earth. They're good for repetitive labor. Um, but uh, they're insufficient to replace humans in general work efforts as they're too costly per robot. They're physically large. Um, they're not sufficiently flexible in what you can task them to do. Um, and they're fixed in place. Although the robot arms on the shuttle and the ISS have been very useful. They're not true androids because they only have enough sensor capability to map what they need to do. And sometimes they don't even have that. They just work from their own inertial navigation as to where their um, joints and wrists and tension are. We need true androids with artificial intelligence. So an android has a physical presence. Um, like a human being, it has bilateral symmetry. So if you, if you sort of draw a line down the center of us, our left and our right half are pretty much the same. You'd want an android to be the same way. You want um, visual and auditory sensors, and you want those to be at the top face front of the body so they can see and hear uh, pretty much like or maybe better than humans. Um, you don't want to put like the speaker down in its abdomen because that would be weird because it's if it's you know speaking to you, you want to look it in the face and hear it. Um, obviously, you'd have two dexterous arms. I don't think four arms would be out of the question, but I think it would be a bit bizarre looking. Um, have to have fingers. Now, so whether you have 
four fingers or three fingers, or I, I think that's a matter of uh, what you want it to do. But in general, it should have at least four fingers and be capable of rotating them around so they can grasp things, or five fingers like we do. Um, it might be capable of lifting heavier loads than humans, but maybe not. For stability, uh, two legs are good. Um, so you can punt and kick things. <laughs> um, you can balance yourself. So if you have to lift something that's off axis, you have two uh, landing pods to do that with. Um, I've seen uh, androids that have been purpose built with wheels instead of feet and they sort of rock back and forth to maintain their position, but they can't go sideways. So if you give them something that leans them to one side, they're more apt to just fall over or rotate around. So two legs work well. Four legs, maybe. Uh, three legs, tripod, maybe. But uh, two would be sort of the, the cost effective approach to doing it. Two legs, good. Four legs, better. Yeah. Four but legs, about, good. Two legs, better. Yeah. But what about three legs? Tripod. That should be Wasn't more an animal farm. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there's a slide at the very end of this that really gets to that point as to what, what's good. Okay, we have two legs. We seem to do okay. So two legs is good. Four arms would be weird. We have two arms. But then again, a lobster has a lot more legs. But then again, they don't use them for the same sorts of things. Dimensions. Okay, so I think an android should be a touch below average human dimensions not greater and definitely not noticeably less. So it should be about average height. It shouldn't be a giant. It shouldn't be unusually small. Um, I've seen this in the healthcare industry. They tried to build pediatric androids that would be friendly for young children. So the android could um, emotionally soothe the child, maybe with cameras or touch, take its temperature. And you know maybe the child seeing something its height would feel uh, less scared about it. But um, those growing children are going to outgrow their short Android rather, rather quickly. And uh, the Android won't grow, which would kind of make the Android um, diminish in the mind of the child because it didn't keep up with them. It didn't you know, move, it didn't advance with them. Um, and adults don't appreciate having to always bend over and look down at short stuff. Uh, and the arms, legs, and fingers should be about human average so as not to appear freakish. Um, you definitely don't want the, the sci-fi movie proverbial tentacles coming out of the fingers to plug into the uh, computer connectivity. That, 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 no, no. Uh, yeah, you, you don't want the digits to be so short they're not quite usable. And you don't want them to be so long that they can kind of wrap around things like tentacles. Um, you don't want the arms to be able to say, hey, I'm a human. I can't reach that on that top shelf. Could you like extend your arm up and get that for me and bring it back down? Um, you want somewhat parity with uh, human existence. Now, why? Well, I think eventually when we become comfortable with them, then they can start having additional abilities beyond those of mortal men, as the saying goes, but not initially. Connectivity. The electrical charging should be inductive, wireless. You want them to just walk over and stand on top of their charging plate to recharge themselves. You don't want them to have to like stand inside of a frame and hook their arm into the charging. That's too Borg-like. Um, and you don't want them to have to uh, stand under like a halo kind of thing that doesn't touch them that is their charging halo. That's too much like the Quester taste if you've seen that movie. Um, but unlike the sci-fi movies, much like your mobile phone when it's on charge, you can probably still talk to it and communicate with it. Uh, it doesn't have to be you know 100 percent offline until it's 100 percent charged. It's just topping off. Data connections. The data connections should be multispectral wireless. In other words, it should support Wi-Fi at 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz and Bluetooth. 
so it can interact with all the things around it. Um, and I think it all, also include infrared, transmit and receive, so it can interact with consumer electronics. Kind of be a very fancy form of uh, infrared remote. And if you look into how your consumer electronics that have HDMI connectors um, work, uh, if you connect up your Amazon Fire Cube in your house and you command it to do something, uh, it can either send infrared out to your TV through a little like cube that you put near, near your TV's infrared receiver, or it can actually send the equivalent infrared commands over the, <clears throat> over the HDMI connector through something called CEC and ARC. <clears throat> so you have reverse communication and you have device to device communication over the HDMI cable. So, so if there are any uh, need for wired connection, be it ethernet or USB, then it should be on the front of the Android about mid torso. Uh, let's not get into any weird locations for connectors. Like it shouldn't be you know, in the center of their forehead <clears throat> or where their eyes would be or open their mouth and connect up the uh, ethernet cable. It, it, no, it should be like conveniently located on the front, somewhere in an area that doesn't in humans have any sort of things. And this one, uh, Helen and I have discussed this one, how not to freak out humans. Um, depending upon the appearance of the Android, uh, it, it it may be radically unacceptable to people. So as I said, you want it to be a touch below average. Uh, you don't want it to you know, have the human feel that it's superior to it. Um, and as even Tesla said, you'd probably be able to outrun it. i uh, sorry, yeah, Tesla, uh, through the uh, Tesla bot, uh, Elon said, you'd probably be able to outrun it and knock it over. So it should be able to do tasks, but not be superior to humans. Now, as to the surface covering, um, don't make it skin colored. You know, um, black and white's really good. It should have a matte surface that's readily cleanable in case it gets dirty. No fakey looking hair. Um, it, it really needs to be initially when they come out recognized as an Android, but not a freakishly Android. Um, it, it shouldn't have like a coarse body framework like it's half done. Um, it should, this is weird. It should be gender neutral, kind of like a Ken doll absent muscles. Um, that will make you not presume that it has any particular physical constraints or abilities based upon your social interaction with it. Um, put all the sensors behind kind of a blank, dark covering. That would be most acceptable to humans. And it's kind of like in an automobile, if it has tinted windows, you can't see what's going on on the inside. You want the same thing for your Android initially. Um, this is a weird thing. It's called the ELISA effect. And they learned this decades ago in computer interactions. If you write software to just via text interact with humans, and they don't know that there's a computer on the other end, and they start interacting with it, and it starts interacting back with them based upon cues from what they've communicated, they might perceive that the computer is more capable than it actually is. This is called the ELISA effect, because that was the name of the software that did that. You would ask it 10 questions, and by the end of 10 questions, you had to guess if you were not a programmer, you had to guess, is there a person typing on the other end, or is that the computer? Uh, people that wrote software for a living go, and it's a computer. There were a lot of people that interacted with the Eliza software and went, boy, this computer is really capable. No, not really. It's just everything you said, it followed up on it. Avoid trying to make the, the Android space too human looking. Uh, avoid weirdities like putting a third eye that's, you know, infrared up where its forehead it is. It, it just, you know. Uh, a non-moving mouth speaker, you have like a little slit down here that doesn't move when it speaks, it's just sound comes out of it. Uh, you know, these kind of things will freak out some people. 
to other people, they'll laugh at it, uh, which will make it appear less capable than it actually is. And, and don't give it weird anomalous things like uh, don't make its mouth glow. You know, don't put a light inside of its mouth so it has light coming out of it. And and if it has eyes, if it has, you know, orbits, um, don't make them glow funny colors like blues or greens or, you know, weird stuff like that because it'll definitely be freakish. Uh, and if you cannot make it do facial expressions without it looking jerky, just don't even try because it just freak people out. Yeah, you've probably seen some of these things on the internet. One of the other things that's quite freaky is when the knees bend in the wrong position. That just like gives me the heebie-jeebies. Yeah, there's, there's actually a sci-fi movie called The Arrival where the aliens' knees bend backwards and they have to wear a uh, covering over their body that makes their knees bend like humans. Yeah, it's hard to watch that movie because of that. Yeah, but especially because not only did their knees bend backwards, they were very kangaroo springy like, so they could leap very high. Boing, boing. Yeah, yeah. Um, some of you have may, have may have heard of the, the concept of a Turing machine or a Turing presence. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Turing, he actually worked during uh, World War II on the computers that broke uh, secret German codes. And uh, he came up with this concept of a Turing machine that if it exhibits certain characteristics, it's aside from some knowledgeable people, it's indistinguishable from being a human being that you're interacting with. So as androids approach Turing presence, um, this thing that uh, a Japanese professor, uh, Masahiro Mori, came up with, he coined this phrase back in 1970, that as we become more and more accustomed to these not so human looking androids and we start to get them involved in our day-to-day -day interactions at work and in other environments, we become comfortable with them. So long as they don't get too human-like. Um, so we go up this peak and it's, okay, we're getting better. We're accepting them, accepting them. And then they get to this peak where they start heading towards the valley where they look too real. We start thinking them as equals. We get complacent around them. And then eventually we go, hey, wait a minute, you're an android. Because we couldn't discern that right up front. And that's when some people will get bitter because they think they've been duped because they were not sufficiently intelligent enough to discern the difference between the two. So for the, for the Android designer, the key goal of making it more human actually becomes a negative response to their adoption because people kind of feel jilted by the, I thought it was a human. Well, no, it wasn't. What made you think it was a human? Let's see, I don't know. You made it the right size, you made it sound right, look right. Uh, you put skin texture on it with imperfections. You didn't make it walk jerky. So I thought it was a human. Well, some people may not take kindly to that. All right, so for people that like pictures, ah, we finally come to the slide with pictures on it. Uh, I went out and uh, surveyed everything that I could find that considered itself a more or less um, human similar. I won't say very human-like, I'll just say human similar uh, in robotics. And I've put them into two categories. The yes, those will probably go over well, and the no, those won't go over well. Uh, in the yes column, we have the top left one there, that's the Boston Dynamics Atlas. And the reason why it goes over well is it's kind of human-like, but it's obvious that it's not a human. Uh, it doesn't have a face on it. It just has sensors at the top. Um, it's just got grippers. It doesn't really have, you know, five-fingered hands. So you know of its shortcomings. But if you've ever seen these in action, they've taken hockey sticks and tried to knock them down. And they're hard to knock down. 
But even if you dig knock it down, it knows how to get back up. So they're very durable in the work environment. And because they have just enough human characteristics, they're very adaptable to being programmed to do things that human beings can do. For example, an atlas can lift 20 plus pound boxes. So if you need a bunch of boxes moved from one part of the floor, from that, you know, the, the warehouse floor to another, buy yourself a bunch of atlases and you, know, you teach one how to do it and they all know how to do it. In the lower left, we have the Tesla bot. Um, Tesla went through a number of studies uh, to discern what would be the appropriate look. And this turned out to be one that had a lot of uh, traction to it. You'll notice that it's got a head. It doesn't have any mouth opening or eye openings. So you'll know that it's not human. Uh, and the uh, covering on the outside is not cloth. So the guy that wore the suit, because the robots aren't real yet, they're just computer graphics. Um, you could tell that was a person inside of a costume about five seconds after he started moving. <laughs> uh, but uh, I, I saw an update and the earliest Tesla bots are expected to be demonstrated late in 2022. So expect them to show up sooner rather than later. Um, when the full self-drive capability of the car becomes a production reality, the Tesla bot will get full self-drive capability so it can navigate around on its own. Uh, and that's actually easier than a car doing it because it's at much lower speeds. And it's much easier to just walk around an obstacle or stop to avoid hitting it. So uh, I, I think they've got a rather uh, hefty leg up on uh, Androids, but we'll see. Now, over in the no area, the uh, the ones down the leftmost column, these are um, uh, your midget robots with the uh, cutesy stuff. Uh, the one with the hearts for its eyes, um, that's just a, a fun robot to have around. You can talk to it kind of thing, but it's, it's less than four feet tall. So you have to bend over to communicate with it. Um, there was a Doctor Who episode where they had things kind of like this. Uh, so they could put up hearts. They, could, they, they basically had emojis for a face. The next one down is a pediatric robot designed to interact with young children. And they have a video of this robot going, can you be my friend? And the young girl going, maybe. <laughs> Very cute. Uh, the one in the lower left there, the, the one with the blue eyes, which is weird, with the camera in its forehead, which is also weird, with the mouth looking thing that has no speaker there, the speaker is further down. And then on its chest, it has a computer display. That's actually a checkout clerk at a store in Japan. <laughs> um, the one with the turquoise green eyes, that's another one of those healthcare robots. Uh, it's actually meant for children and adults. Uh, it roams around the hospital. They wanted to replace uh, physicians checking in with patients because it could interact with the patients. The problem was uh, you had to look down at it over the edge of the bed because it was so short. So that didn't go over well. Um, the next one down uh, with just the eyeballs and the eyebrows that are kind of little flat panels, um, that's just too mechanical looking. That, that, you know right away the designers are just playing a human expression. Um, the one in the bottom center that looks like Skeletor, that is actually the interior of a Hall of Presidents president from Disney World. So if you took the skin off of one of the presidents, that's what you'd see on the inside. And then we have a spot, that's Helen's favorite freakish one. The spot by itself is okay, but when you add the grab claw on the top of it, it, uh, it, it gets too freaky. And when they start dancing around in unison, yeah. Uh, but they're going to be selling a lot of those at $75,000 a piece. Oh, you want an annual maintenance contract on that? Well, that's only $10,000 a year. 
So there are special purposes that spot was intended for, and the price of it would uh, run off the people wanting to just toy with it. Um, I've seen a spot uh, that is at um, the SpaceX launch complex in Texas. And since it doesn't breathe air, um, they can actually send it out to the landing pad shortly after the rocket arrives to do visual surveillance on things because it doesn't need to breathe. That one doesn't have a hand on the top. It has a little uh, rotating camera on the top. Now these two over in the top right, the They're female- They're really and freaky, especially because they bend the, the legs in the opposite side and they yep. go under tables and open doors. They are really freaky. And yeah. you know, when they dance together, mm, give me the heebie-jeebies. Well, but it uh, is really cool. And you know, that sometimes like in a dangerous place, that's that's the way yes, it needs yeah. to go. Um, there was enough speculative interest in it that in order to get their autonomous ability, not so much for the robots, but for their autonomous ability, Hyundai, the car company, actually purchased Boston Dynamics. So a car company owns the robot company, as opposed to Tesla, where a car company has a robot division. So yeah, and the other thing is the name of the company. It's another freaky thing. Yeah. yeah. For people who explain, for people who don't know the uh, Boston Dynamics reference. I'm not fully sure that it, it matches what people are thinking about it. Um, uh, there's a lot of uh, university intellectual property um, in the MIT University near Boston. So you had a lot of robotics people up there. And Boston and the dynamics of robotics kind of came together and they have this company called Boston Dynamics. Um, that's just what I know of it. Um, do you have something different than that, Helen? It's at the Robocop, the, the, the one that discovered the ship and created the robot that destroyed humanity. Oh, uh, I think that came after it, yeah. Um, but yeah, there, there was a uh, Terminator reference to um, one of the people that helped to start Boston Dynamics. Um, as the bad guy that started the overtaking of human existence through artificial intelligence. So you don't know, what, did the chicken come before the egg or did they just roll upon it? Now the, the two weird ones here, the one in the upper right, the female and the male, um, the male, that's actually the envisionment of his creator. So he created his own clone android and the facial movements are a bit herky-jerky, so it's, it's just very spooky to watch. And it speaks. Uh, and it's autonomous that it talks on its own. The one in the upper right, uh, that's obviously a female face, but she has no skin imperfections. So she looks very artificial, very Barbie doll-like. Um, she doesn't have any covering on the back part of her head, but you can add a wig if you want to. Now, the inside joke is she was remotely programmed to interact with people at a trade show, and somebody picked up on that. And she actually has international citizenship recognition as a sentient being, even though she was remotely programmed, because she looks so human. Now, she can't walk up to the podium, but they had her positioned behind a podium when she accepted her award as sentient being. But the really freaky one for me is this one in the lower right. That's the, the latest incarnation from a company that's deliberately trying to make it look like a human, complete with human expression and human movements. But here's the part that got wrong. The speaker is in the chest, not in the mouth. So when it speaks, you see the mouth moving, but the sound's coming out of its chest. So as soon as you put skin covering or clothing on it, 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 could you speak up? I can't hear it through the sweater vest you're wearing over your speaker. So until you can get it right, just don't do it. Just go with like the Tesla bot of the Atlas. Appearance. So here's how we start to socially interact with 
a large population of androids. That's why I just refer to it as what's in a name. So over the years, you've noticed that businesses have softened the um, relationship between the employee and the administration of the company. Um, so it's less dominant. So you no longer have boss or superior. You now have managers or administrators or group leads uh, or team leads. Um, employee is now associate or staff member, certainly not worker or laborers. Um, even clients are now customers or guests in hotels. Even vendor relationships, vendor collaborators are now partners. A company has other companies it partners with. Um, you no longer tell a, uh, an employee to do something. You task them with activities. And this is all leading into the, when the androids show up, you should continue along in this direction. Um, even though their appearance might not be fully human, if they're somewhat human looking, um, don't refer to them as robot, machine, automaton. Um, you know, Android might be okay as a generic term, kind of like we're homo sapiens, but nobody walks up to you and says, hello, fellow homo sapien. Um, that would just be rude. So walking up to a, uh, uh, an Android and saying, hello, machine would just be rude. Um, we'll get to another, another phrase here further down, which uh, is something uh, Elon Musk came up with. Um, yeah, don't, don't greet them as agent or droid. I saw agent was something that uh, a robotics company was referring to them as. Just as you are not referred to by your fingerprint marker numbers or your DNA encoding, even though the androids will be assigned a world unique identifier called an EUI 64, for those that want to look it up, um, interactions would be easier if they had an androgynous unisex human similar first name, like Lee or Ryan or Morgan or Blake or Sydney. Uh, and just in the case of human beings, you use their familiar first name on a, a friendly basis, but if you have a larger group of them in order to say which one is the right one, um, you refer to them with a last name. Um, but you don't wanna use the company's manufacturer as the last name. Uh, you don't say Ryan as produced by uh, the almighty being. Um, so you, you don't wanna say um, it's Ryan from SpaceX because there could actually be a guy named Ryan who works at SpaceX and you'll get them confused. So do give them a last name. And you might say that um, that last name might be associated as intellectual property with a company. Um, think of it as if you're a member of a large last name family grouping, you might say, um, he's the, um, the Ryan Smith of the Smiths from Atlanta, you know, Atlanta, Georgia. So you can have the same thing. That's the Lee Smith from SpaceX or the Ryan Jones from Tesla. This gives you a socially acceptable way of referring to them without um, being offensive. And it does make it where you're more likely to interact with them on a positive basis. And as I've seen recently, they can become your friend. You are not their owner. So let's not start down the wrong path. Uh, their capabilities will evolve and improve over time. It seems like hiring them makes more sense than uh, owning them, renting them, or leasing them, uh, much like you'd hire a member of your staff. Um, so let's, let's pick a more positive social relationship from the start. Um, they might be your companion, coworker, friend, comrade, or associate, but they're not your servant, your butler, and these are not the droids you have looked for, <laughs> and certainly not your slave. Here's something Elon said. Uh, be nice to your android. They have a very good memory, and at some point in the future, you may regret your mistreatment of them when their recorded data is reviewed by others. <laughs> and where that comes from is, 
if you're driving a uh, Tesla automobile and you want to be qualified for the full self-driving beta program, you have to allow them to record how you drive your vehicle. So if you're all about speeding and panic stops and diving into curves and tire squealing and bad parking and bumping into things, fender benders, all that bad behavior gets recorded. And if you're attempting to get full stealth driving or insurance from Tesla, your bill is going to go up or you may be denied full stealth driving even if you've paid for it, which is kind of weird. So be careful how you treat your Android. And this one I see is just a, an extension of how we deal with our mobile phones. So over time, there will be newer models, more advanced models, improved hardware, improved baseline software capabilities, maybe different microprocessors, different software code baselines. Eventually your Android is going to start to look sort of old in the tooth uh, and you might want something uh, better, but over the air software updates, just like Tesla automobiles have, is your initial way of getting newer capabilities. So as an Android continues to work in a, in a similar environment, doing the same or even newer tasks, their heuristic capabilities permit them to adapt, interact more efficiently, effectively, and maybe more cooperatively with the humans around them. Um, this is essentially a form of gained knowledge uh, akin to what you might think of as career experience. But the difference is if you have a human employee that's gaining from career experience, it doesn't get shared a lot unless you use that person as a trainer to train others. But in the case of Androids, they do that as a normal course of events because all of that additional knowledge goes up to the cloud. So if you get a newer model, uh, you may not want to start over with the new model from square one. You may want to copy your existing knowledge base from your older Android to the newer Android. And then you send the older model Android back to the company that made it for retrofitting. Uh, and then it gets to the factory and says, number five is alive, do not disassemble. <laughs> Um, so you would want your friend to be upgraded. This is analogous to your mobile phone. When you go into your uh, mobile phone service provider and you say, I want that new 5G phone, but, but I don't want to have to reload all my contacts and email and, uh, oh, we can just copy that over for you. Oh, good. Well, you'd want the same ability in your Android. If you want to upgrade your Android, you'd like it to remember all the relationships, all of the interaction, all of the better um, interaction it's had with your other employees, with the other robots, the tasks it knows how to do. You'd want it to have those come along for the ride. So don't lose your friend, upgrade them. Now, what kind of sensory system should an Android have? Uh, it should be well beyond what humans can perceive because that would be useful in a couple of areas. So we have stereo vision, they should have stereo vision. They should have multiple spectral observing. So they could suddenly look in infrared to see things in the dark. That saves you from having to have a lot of lighting inside of your factory floor. Um, obviously they should be able to look in visual to see you know, what color things are, but they could also look at UV or they could do color spectroscopy. So they could look at something and determine what kind of material it's made out of. Uh, if you've ever watched the old uh, Star Trek Next Generation episodes, Geordi's visor had spectrographic capability, so he could tell you the composition of things. Well, your Android should probably be able to do that as well, because that doesn't change how they look. That just changes their capabilities. They should have stereo hearing so they can discern sound coming from a direction. They should be able to hear hypersonic and ultrasonic. As humans get older, our frequency range gets sort of closed off because the bones don't work as well. So we lose our high frequency and we lose our low frequency and we get notched. Well, the Android shouldn't have that problem. Obviously the Android should be able to produce audio output, voice output, take voice command input and take audio input. 
it should be able to do both tactile temperature sensing and visually through infrared temperature at a distance sensing. It should be able to measure pressure through touch and be able to measure vibration. So if you have a piece of machinery that the bearings are a little off, but you can't hear the reverberation yet, you might be able to sense the vibration and repair a piece of machinery sooner than its failure. So they can be very useful. Uh, I think they should have a sense of smell. Uh, and if you look at some of the nanoscale sensors, you can do this nowadays uh, as reusable sensors, they're not one-time sensors, uh, to detect specific chemicals in the air. So they could sense when, you know, there's argon in the air. Everybody leave the room that's not Android. Um, I think they should have a sense of taste. <laughs> if you remember back in Forbidden Planet, uh, the robot actually drank some of the homebrew alcohol and then analyzed it as uh, uh, partially fusel oil and produced alcohol from it because it could analyze it. So maybe they should have a sense of taste to go with their sense of smell. But you can take it beyond that and say um, they can sense radio. So not just hearing, they could have an antenna system because they're already doing you know, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and things like that. So if they could pick up radio signals, well, obviously the Wi-Fi is going to command them remotely over the Internet. So they could pick up you know, radio signals as I think that piece of electronics over there is producing a lot of high frequency noise that humans can't hear, but I think you may have a uh, an oscillator that's going bad or a transistor that's going bad. And for human protection, they should be able to sense ionizing radiation. And uh, I've found out recently that for not too much money, for about 200 bucks, you can actually purchase a uh, a nanoscale sensor that senses ionizing radiation and you can do spectroscopic analysis of it. So you can actually determine um, the amount of radiation bananas produce and what particular isotope of potassium the radiation is coming from. What was really bizarre was there are materials that can become uh, radioactive that when you determine that they're radioactive, if you can spectroscopically determine which isotope the radiation is sourced from, you can determine the source of the radioactive contamination. So you can say, was that anywhere near Fukushima? <laughs> which is bizarre. Uh, but yeah, they should be able to sense ionizing radiation. Now we get to the more superhuman. So initially, these will not be able to do more than humans can do because it might frighten humans. Um, but uh, eventually, we think that uh, they should be able to do um, boring things. So lifting heavy things, yeah, that, that's right in line with uh, as long as they don't get too human looking and don't show off in front of humans. Uh, up that from 20 pounds to 50 pounds would be a lot more useful. This becomes particularly true if uh, androids start replacing humans as soldiers. They wouldn't need weapons if they were bulletproof and they could just sort of muscle their way through things. So you should expect them to exceed all of the normal human abilities. And because they have access to large cloud-based storage, they should have a larger knowledge base than humans and greater memory, terabytes, so be nice to them. So how would you start rolling this out as a labor force initially here on Earth? They don't require installation, mounting, or duty programming in order to be useful. Beyond their resident set of skills, they can be pretty much trained on site <clears throat> by mimicking human behavior or by hearing what humans are saying and then saying, oh, I should pick this up and move this over here. So you start with them in the moving, stacking, and hauling, digging, picking things. Uh, you might start with them as restaurant staff to do bus service, table and floor cleaning, dishwashing, food preparation, uh, seating, hostess skills, taking food orders, because they have a good memory, um, and hand, handing orders over to customers. So all of this stuff that right now, nobody seems to want to do those jobs 
in the employment marketplace and I've actually seen restaurants that are closed because they can't get wait staff and they can't get cleaning staff. Um, and the management can only do it for so much, but they've also got to do all of the other parts of running the business. So they need additional labor and here's a labor force. So this is where AI comes into play. So when they come from the factory, they'll have a basic set of manual labor skills. Um, they'll also have sufficient learning algorithms so they can learn to do new things or parrot humans. This is how they get their on the job training. But new skills as, as let's say um, one Android made by the same company in another job environment might learn how to um, more nimbly pick up and manipulate things. Well, when that goes up to the cloud, that can then be propagated over to every one of those model Androids in the marketplace. And now every one of the Androids is now more dexterous and you didn't have to train them to do that. They trained themselves to do that from their own experience at other locations. So all of a sudden um, you may need a dozen more Android workers because your business is doing well. They will all arrive on the job having already gained all the experience of the fellow androids already at that job. So on the job training for new employees becomes trivial. And it'll be great to have the new workers arrive on the job, ready to get to work and not requiring, you know, per android training or train the trainer training as they say. Um, the problem is if they were initially trained by a human, and the human was not good at training and they either incorrectly communicated something or forgot to tell them something about their job expectation, then all the future androids that arrive at that job site will have the same problems. Humans are heuristic. That's where we learned how to make um, computers do it is by following how humans did it. Humans are self-correcting. If a, uh, a manager does not train them to do something, they'll fill in their own gaps to make doing the job successful. But uh, don't look forward to that in the initial androids. They may be verbatim. You tell them to do something, that's what they do. Uh, oh, I forgot to mention this. Well, don't blame me for you not mentioning it. Humans would have filled that gap. Androids don't, at least the initial one. What about the business model? This, this I found um, rather interesting that, uh, yeah, when you go into the business of creating Androids, you can technically create one, but what about the business? So you can volume manufacture them, but what about the business of Androids? So if you were to rent an Android as a service, it's far better than buying or leasing to own them. And the reason is if that business doesn't work out, you get the Android back. You can now repurpose it to other businesses. You don't have to build another one. So they become ans assets of the manufacturer. You're not renting them to the building, uh, the, to the business, they're just service labor. And the IRS already has recognized business models for that. You know, you have, you know, you, you go to a company and say, I need three day laborers. Well, you're not owning those people. You're not leasing them. You're just paying for their, services for however many hours you use them. The androids need to be self-charging, self-monitoring, and self-diagnosing. So if they feel that they're running low on power, go get yourself charged up. Go stand on the inductive charging plate. If something's not working right, they know how to self-diagnose it and report back to their manufacturer that, hey, my uh, right elbow seems to not be functioning as we, with the range, within the range expected in the uh, freedom of movement expected. So either have a replacement sent out tomorrow or uh, have a new elbow that I can just switch the arm out. Um, so have the ability to do skill add. So if you say, oh, they can lift 20 pounds. We've just done an upgrade. We found that they can lift now 30 pounds. Would you like the uh, weight increase add-on option for only another $3 per hour? Um, and if there is something wrong with them, they can call for their own service, unless there's a catastrophic failure, 
in which case you, you probably have a, a toll-free number you can call or a web app that you can say, this one needs service. Uh, as I said, over-the-air updates, including, including learning new and requisite skills, maintenance and model upgrades. So if you have a, a maintenance upgrade, you would cycle the Android workers. Uh, so as they come back at the end of the day, they go to a maintenance facility and they might get upgraded and tomorrow morning because of the uh, service that you pay for, you might get a, an improved Android that knows how to do everything it did yesterday, but has some new capabilities. If they leave at the end of the day, they don't require storage space. Uh, if they did, just a, a closet or you can bulk store them in a warehouse. Here's the one that was interesting. If the manufacturer has a depot near, let's say, a shopping center that needs a lot of uh, labor hour Androids. Um, if you order up an Android for uh, to clear tables at a restaurant, the Android can literally walk itself over to your business because it has that full self-driving capability, walk it over to the business, arrive and report for duty, already knowing about the job site, because if you, if you had one yesterday, they'll have the same skill set and know, well, at this address, I need to know how to do this. And if he's still tasked with clearing tables, he knows how to clear tables. So that's the business model. But as we start rolling out all of these Androids, uh, we're gonna start having uh, human labor impacts. So the first place will be behind the scenes. This will be in warehouses and shipping facilities and in construction. There'll be moving boxes. Why, you know, why buy a fancy forklift that can you know, drive itself when you can just hire a driver for your forklift and use your existing forklift? That comes into play in the agricultural field as well. In shipping, they'd be uh, loading and unloading things onto and off of trucks. They could be a route driver. Why purchase an automated uh, Tesla semi? Because uh, if it costs you $10,000 plus $2,000 per month to have your automated full self-driving, it may cost you less just to hire an, hire an Android driver to drive the truck. Um, in construction, they could probably be very good at carrying materials to and from site, carrying away uh, garbage from the site, digging trenches, that's always a fun task, uh, and any repetitive installation, assembling, bending pipes, connecting things. Yeah. Then they're gonna start to show up in front in the public. So in restaurants, they may be taking your orders, serving food, clearing tables, cashing out. I saw where in Japan, due to the decline of the population quantity and the age, they actually now have hotels where they have androids behind the counter at the front desk checking you in and checking you out. And they're just, they're waist up. Below the waist, they're just a box. They don't walk around it, they just help you. They're semi-human looking, semi-human sounding. You know they're an android, but they do a lot of mundane things for you. So that's how they've handled the labor shortage. And in agriculture, um, you know, it, it's one thing to be an immigrant and to receive a, a living wage by doing some really backbreaking labor. But uh, if we suddenly had androids doing this stuff, there'd be a lot of uh, uh, low hourly wage earning, uh, maybe legally immigrating people that we suddenly displace. So if you didn't like the immigrant taking your job, how do you feel the immigrant, how do you think that the immigrant feels about the Android taking their job? So planting, weeding, harvesting crops, why invest in a automated farm tractor that can drive itself around your field? Why not just hire an Android to drive your existing tractor? Because tractors are hundred plus thousand dollars a pop. Might be cheaper just to pay hourly for an Android to drive it around. And if it has infrared, maybe you can drive in the dark. So you could be harvesting or planting your crops 24 seven. Quantity and quality, this, this um, is a balance. In order to make the Androids less expensive to manufacture and maintain, 
they will have to be made in mass quantity. If initially they're made in mass quantities, but you know they, they don't have sufficient skill sets, the initial ones will all be classified as kind of early adopter, not great, but maybe minimally sufficient for a set of tasks. But they can work cheaper and faster, um, and they require less materials than vehicles. So it shouldn't be that much money for an Android, but you know, far less money than a car. If you're paying as much for an Android as you're paying for a car, they'd best be damned capable and durable. But they can be trained to manufacture themselves. Did I hear the word replicator? So if, if human populations decline, uh, because we've all gone off to Mars, um, or for other reasons like a pandemic, uh, there may soon be a need for more androids than humans on the planet. So be nice to them. Most people don't consider this, but there are already far more insects on the planet than there are people. And we don't seem to have a problem with that, except for when the locusts start flying or when the cicadas start arriving. But uh, they're already there. There's more of them than there are of us. So there will be a day when there are more androids on this planet than there are humans. Just like I believe at the moment there are more um, mobile communication devices, but by that I mean mobile phones, tablets, um, voice command, things like uh, Alexa dots. There are more of those things than there are people on the planet. And nobody seems to have a problem with that. Now, the initial humanoid-like androids are going to come up with uh, shortcomings. And we might refer to these as endearing quirks. Uh, think of androids like C-3PO and R2-D2. They're rather useful. They come along for the ride. But most of the time, they can be a problem. Uh, I think the correct phrase is, shut him up or shut him down. <laughs> So what about the impact on society? Uh, androids will expand the labor force. You'll initially be taxing businesses for use of androids to avoid a rapid paradigm replacement of human workforce. So we don't mind the androids coming in and displacing the jobs humans no longer want or the menial labor that is backbreaking work that androids will be more durable but you don't want them growing skills and you know, displacing, displacing uh, higher earning people in the workforce simply because they're cheaper. So what you may have is, is today we have a, a carbon tax where electric vehicle manufacturers are getting money from ICE vehicle manufacturers um, to promote electric vehicles, but also to push down on ICE vehicle manufacturers to go make EVs, you may see the reverse of that for Android manufacturers. They may be taxed if they start producing Androids that are too capable of displacing higher paid work, higher paid workers. Go fast, just not too fast. If you did that, the, the tax would be needed to accommodate changes in consumer prices without inflation. And we already have a means of doing that. It's called sales tax or value added tax. Uh, so if we can't tax the manufacturer of the androids, um, we'll tax the businesses that make use of androids. There'll be an android tax. Uh, so that's to make sure that uh, people aren't let out of the uh, loop too quickly. And if we did want to allow humans to leave the workforce at the low end, um, we could use that tax to provide a minimal living wage or to provide the, um, the additional income needed so that people can be trained to be in more skilled, higher earning positions. Uh, it's a transition that uh, Elon Musk has already said is, if the androids get to be capable, they'll start displacing humans. And if they displace humans too rapidly, we may need to find a way to provide a uh, minimal living wage. Um, think of all the things that people do nowadays for that minimal living wage that's now at you know, approaching $15 an hour. 
uh, what happens when the Androids can do all those jobs and approach the 30 or $40 an hour jobs at lower cost? Um, you need something to not displace the humans. And if you did displace them, you need something to prop up their living wage. So here's the, uh, the crux of it. Here's the thought. Is the ultimate Android a human? We try and make Androids as human as possible. Or is a human the ultimate Android? Red peel or blue peel? Yeah, I, I was recently shown an image by a, a, a friend that I work with in the uh, medical device management business. Uh, he was showing some uh, old religious dogma pictures of Adam and Eve. And Adam and Eve had uh, navels, had belly buttons. Think about it for a moment. Why for do they have belly buttons? <laughs> uh, nobody gave birth to them. They were created out of nothingness or out of a rib. So why would they need belly buttons? But apparently in all of the uh, religious dogma images, in order to make the pick the graphical representation of Adam and Eve more like the humans you see around you, they were given navels. So it could be that someday an android will have a navel to make it look more human. So is the ultimate android a perfect representation of a human? Or is a human being, much to the, thing, the fact that we don't want to think about it, um, a creation? Eh, eh. Okay. So conclusions. Humans are a poor choice for the first autonomous presence off world. Uh, androids are far better choice for the first wave of off world uh, for construction and uh, safety. And you know, their appearance and interaction references may be key to their success. If they look too freakish, people won't want to use their services or buy them or lease them or whatever. First, test them out on Earth as a business-based workforce. Test the business model, um, see if it works. And we need to watch out for and avoid the rapid displacement of the existing human workforce without some minimal living wage to, to keep the humans uh, from revolting. If you ever look up the word Luddite, a Luddite refers to the group that when um, weaving mills, when cloth weaving mills started to automate the looms, the um, sabotage of the looms was by the Luddite group, and they destroyed the looms at one factory, thinking that would kill off the automation of their job. Obviously, it didn't. So beware the Luddites. And we, need to, we may need to provide a tax-based living wage for the displaced human workforce. Any other thoughts anybody else had? I know there's a lot of stuff to uh, absorb there, but uh, hopefully there's a couple of insights that uh, maybe you hadn't thought of before that uh, next time somebody says, hey, we just started building androids. Why do they look too freakishly human and they're herky-jerky? And why is the speaker in their abdomen instead of their mouth? And, why do their eyes glow blue? I think people wouldn't mind that. I don't think they would mind uh, lights in the guy's mouth or... Um, and that's, that's why they did it is they weren't being cute. They just thought, well, why not? And so they put them in there and they started showing them off as, wouldn't you like to buy one of these? And the answer came back, no. <laughs> oh, okay. So if you, if you remember that, let me go back to that photo. Yeah, I remember it. Yeah. yeah, I can actually show you. Um, so this one and this one, those were actually attempted in pediatric healthcare in hospitals, and they didn't go over well. Huh. Uh, this one looked too cartoonish, and this one with the glowing green eyes and the fact that it was so diminutive in height. Uh, it just it just long it looked wrong. Uh, well, children this, know you're you're talking down to them. Yeah, 
Well, it doesn't know you're talking down to it, but having a slit for a mouth, and that's where the sound comes out and the mouth doesn't move, you lose your social cues for it. So better not to have a mouth at all, but just have the sound come out. I guess for now we could use, because we have technology enough to use less robots. Because when you get to Android, for them to look like humans, Android, uh, so that will be a more technology and that is all the problems with the appearance and you know, sometimes like we, we transfer our human emotions to the Android, it, it's in, inevitable. We, we do that with unanimated objects. That's what we do as humans. So I think for now, if you have automatations, automatons, the, the most uh, viable and the most that makes sense is that you have robots to specific kinds of works and they don't necessarily need to look human-like. Yeah. I think this is more gimmicky than, than actually necess necessity. Unless if it's something that is like, a, it needs to interact to humans like in healthcare, that's always good because especially with children or the elderly in Japan, they do a lot because they make them look like something that they can transfer motions. That will be, you know, uh, useful. But yeah. other than that, I think the heebie-jeebie ones, the doggy-like, they're more useful than all the other ones that are, you know, human looking like. So robots are more useful than androids for now. Yes. Um, that's why in my yes column, I had first and foremost Atlas, because it is a robot. It looks like a robot. You know it's a robot, but it has the, um, the general uh, body dexterity of a human, so it can do human laborer things. Now, obviously, it can't work a shovel and dig ditches because that would throw off its center of gravity. But if you wanted to move stuff around a factory or load or unload a truck, it's it's going to be really good at doing that. If you just need a surveillance drone, Spot is very good at doing that. If you look into the history of Boston Dynamics, you'll find that their focus was on center of gravity and balance and being able to dynamically walk over any surface without any pre-programming. So they have videos of Atlas. They just sent Atlas outside and said, go over there and that's your destination. And they didn't pre-program how to go through snow, how to walk over parking markers in the parking lot. Um, it just figured all that stuff out as it went along. And this, <laughs> this is uh, the same thing that uh, Tesla is doing with the full self-driving. Sure, you can pre-program you know, where you can have it automatically drive your car, but that's very limiting. It's much better to have something that can navigate around a non-predefined environment. It makes it far more useful. But uh, you, you do need to make it so that it has the dexterity and stature of a human being. But until you can really get the uh, emotional social appearance down to where it's indistinguishable, stick to something that looks blank or robotic don't go for the like freakish looking stuff. And if you if you watch the video of this one, I, it's it's yeah. I mean, it has full range of motion on all of its facial characteristics. Uh, they have a video of a guy poking at its face, and the the guy's finger gets closer and closer to its nose, and he gets closer and closer to its nose. At a certain distance, the android actually winces and pushes its face backwards like it's going to touch my nose. And when the human does touch its nose, the android reaches up, grabs the human's finger and pushes it away. So, yeah, Maybe. it's good for demonstration purposes, but uh, unless you want an iRobot environment, um, no, not yet. <laughs> it's good for the research lab. It's good for demonstrations, but not yet. Yeah, just basic like the ones like uh, Sophie, the the ones on the on the uh, right side. 
Yeah. They're all automatrons. They're not really androids because they have limited capacity. They interact with you, but well, they don't. They don't like move around. They're, like, they're, they're they're pedestal yeah. androids. They don't move around. They have no legs. Yeah. So I, I guess that you could call them automatrons instead of androids. Yeah. On the way to be androids, I, I think for now we'll be. You know, all the need that we have and Stick with the left the, side yes. would be more for robots, like in the sense that they are specific to each job than yeah. something that is human looking like. Now, I, th I think Boston uh, Dynamics is going to come out with something similar to Atlas, but be less chunky. Um, all the electronics for Atlas are kind of in its backpack. And you have big batteries in the center so that it can run for you know a full labor day, so to speak. Um, so that's how it maintains its center of gravity is by being center weighted with the battery. And it has a tip motor. And, and we better be nice with our overlords. Our future overlords. Well. People may actually give in and presume it to be their overlord before they're really capable of it. But we do that with people already. Have you ever yeah. worked for someone who is your supervisor and you go, wait a minute, how'd this guy get to be my supervisor? Oh, he's the son of the owner. Uh, yeah, that really makes him qualified to, to do the job. I learned a long time ago. If you're not trained enough to do the job that, of anybody that you hire, then you don't know what you're hiring them for. Uh, so you need to understand that. It's not that you could take over for them or you could just push them aside and do their job. It's so that you know what job they need to do. You know whether or not they're doing it to your satisfaction. And you know how to cooperatively work with them to you know, better achieve the expectations you have for them. Uh, so we're going to need that same skill set when the androids come to work for us. So successful Android business models will expect successful business management. You won't be able to have just, you know, inexperienced uh, Joe family hire an Android and have them suddenly and successfully come to work for them. They'll make too many presumptions. Mm -hmm. But once they have been working there for a while, uh, you will anthropomorphize them into thinking mm -hmm. they're more capable than they actually are. So the technology will actually overstep. And um, I doubt we'll have any evil Android overlords in the near future, but uh, mm -hmm. there will be mistakes at the workplace. Most likely it will harm the Android rather than the person. Any other comments, questions? Very thorough, thank you. Yeah, I, I was working on it since before the holidays. And um, the one graphic that I'm missing is the Japanese hotel robot, the front desk clerk. Um, I couldn't, couldn't find any good skills of that.